How's it going people? The high performance estate has grown hugely in popularity since the early 2000s and more and more of them just seem to be popping up everywhere. Audi are doing them, Mercedes are doing them, BMW are doing them, just all brands seem to be putting out high performance estates. These cars mix practicality and performance so that you basically don't have to choose between the two, though your fuel bills tend to still be quite high. As this is something that started in the 2000s, depreciation has come along and made some of these cars quite affordable. So in this video, I'm gonna talk you through the top five cheap and fast estates that you can buy for less than 10,000 pounds. And you can let me know in the comments if you agree or disagree with my picks. I'm a huge estate fan and my first car was actually a Skoda Fabia estate and I can definitely see myself buying one of these in the next few years depending on kind of how money goes and that kind of stuff. As always remember that I do these videos from the UK market perspective so prices in other countries may differ and remember also that whenever you're buying a second hand car you have to think about insurance, tax, maintenance and repairs but I'll talk about those a little bit during the video. If you enjoy the video remember to like and subscribe for more weekly car content but without further ado let's get into the video. Starting us off in 5th place is the only car on this list that isn't from Germany, and a car that likes to cause a few debates, a 2nd generation Subaru Impreza WRX Sport Wagon, which actually comes with two different engine options depending on the year you go for. The most recent engine in the car is a turbocharged 2.5 litre 4 cylinder which puts out 226 brake horsepower, taking it from 0-60 to in just 5.9 seconds, partially due to its all wheel drive layout and 320 newton metres of torque. Now let's get right into those debates, in a previous video I was called out for how I pronounced Subaru, which is totally fair as it isn't really that normal. The reason I say it this way is because I've always thought that it was the correct pronunciation of the word. I'll put a link below to one of the earliest Subaru adverts in English and they pronounce it the same way as me. Most people pronounce it Subaru and I pronounce it Subaru in line with the old adverts, but in fact the Japanese pronunciation is Subaru. Again, I'll put some links down below to some Japanese people pronouncing it properly rather than me butchering it. And in terms of the word Impreza, people also disagree on this. In the UK it tends to be pronounced Impreza, while in the US I've heard a lot of people say Impressa. Again, either way, let's not have a fight about it and let's just enjoy the car. As if that wasn't enough to fight about, the car is actually classified as a hatchback even though it's generally referred to as the Impreza Estate in journalist articles, reviews, classified as from owners and just generally by people, and it has the US terminology for estate in its name, the Sport Wagon. As Subaru very much had tax in mind when building the car, it may simply have been a ploy to ensure people paid less on their monthly costs, as in the UK at least, tax on hatchbacks tends to be lower than on estates, or maybe it was simply categorised as this due to its sloping rear end rather than the vertical one. Either way, I have always called this the Impreza Estate so forgive me if you disagree. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's actually talk about the car for a second. There were three distinct aesthetics for the Impreza, and all are easy to remember by their headlights. The original has rounded ones and is generally referred to as the bug eye. The first facelift has a blob with a rectangle, which is named the blob eye. And finally, the second facelift has the most aggressive headlights of the three, and is called the Hawkeye. All three were flagship models for Subaru, and were used to great success in the World Rally Championship, with Petter Solberg winning the championship in 2003 in the blob this is the last time Subaru won the WRC, and the last time someone who's not from France won the WRC, and the last time someone who isn't called Sebastian won the WRC, so Subaru should really feel proud in a sense. But let's get into pricing. You can pick up a Hawkeye for as little as 3 grand for a high mileage and slightly ropey model, while 10k will get you a well looked after example with less than 70,000 miles on the clock. Not bad at all for the money, I'd probably say this is the bargain on the list in terms of performance and price. Reliability is a little all over the place with the Impreza. Some say it's been perfect, while others say it's a nightmare. The overall build quality of the car is quite strong, but there are some known issues with the 2.5 litre engine, including most notably the head gasket leaking or failing entirely, leading to overheating and engine failure. From what I can see from owners' forums and reviews, the 2 litre engine is the more reliable of the two, and a better option if you're worried about something going wrong. For me though, the Impreza will always have a place in my heart. I also think the WRX hatchback estate or whatever you want to call it is a really good looking car with any of the different facelifts. I'd personally go for a saloon just for the rally pedigree, but either way, a great car to start off this list. A slightly less controversial car in 4th, but a much rarer one, with only 139 in total on the roads in the UK in 2018, the B6 VW Passat R36. You're probably aware of the Golf R32, and the Passat is its lesser known and somewhat beefier sibling. 
It comes with a 3.6 litre VR6 engine that puts out 295 brake horsepower, 350 Nm of torque and goes from 0 to 60 in 5.6 seconds thanks to its all wheel drive. It also has the best fuel economy on this list at 28 miles per gallon which isn't too bad, not as good as the 335D I mentioned in the last video but still respectable. It comes in both saloon and estate variants with the latter being the rarer of the two and compared with the standard model it comes with a bunch of sportier features to make it a more interesting purchase than other 6th generation Passats. Front and rear spoilers, a DSG gearbox with paddle shift, a sporty flat bottom steering wheel, 18 inch alloys, 20mm lower suspension, heated Recaro seats and twin rear exhaust pipes. Not bad for a car with 531 litres of boot space. Pretty sure that's more space than my entire car. They seem to be going up in value too, as Parker's note the car at around £5,600 to £13,000, but I can only find one available at the moment for just under 10 grand, with quite a few miles on the clock. When buying an R36, there is one main issue you need to be aware of, that DSG gearbox. Even though the 6-speed box in the car is generally seen as less troublesome when compared with the 7-speed one, it is still subject to failures, so I would suggest getting someone who knows how to inspect and feel a DSG box to come with you if you're looking to purchase one. Clear signs of a failing DSG will be shuddering when moving from a standing start, strange shift patterns, and any abnormal noises or harsh changes from the box. A few Passats were actually recalled due to the DSG computer related issues, so this is something that VW are very much aware of, and you as a purchaser should be aware of too. Is the R36 a car I'd buy? Probably not mainly because I like manuals and wouldn't want to buy an auto with a known transmission issue, but I also really don't like that chrome front end. Same as with the R32, it would have to be painted or wrapped very quickly after purchase. That said, I really do respect the car for what it is, and I can certainly see it being a classic in its own right in the future, hence it well deserves its place in this list. Onto the top 3 now, and in 3rd place we have the E61 BMW 550i M Sport Touring, of which there are only 11 registered on the roads in the UK at the end of 2018. So the fact that this one is up for sale now for £8,000 is quite special. Even though Parker suggests the car goes for less than that, I wouldn't trust that figure, as these cars probably don't sell often in the UK. It has a naturally aspirated 4.8 litre V8 that puts out 361 brake horsepower, 490 Nm of torque, and goes from 0 to 60 in 5.4 seconds making this rear-wheel drive beast a real force to be reckoned with on the roads. The 550i has the most powerful of all E60 BMWs that aren't an M car, as the M5 obviously takes the number one spot and also comes in a far more expensive estate variant too. The N62 engine under the bonnet is also used in the X5 4.8 IS, 650i and 750i, as well as the Morgan Aero 8 and Super Sports, which is a pretty cool cameo. This edition of the 5 Series lineup also came with some quite desirable features, but what's really cool is that the saloon version actually has 50-50 weight distribution, meaning incredibly good handling, which the Touring is not too far off. It's a really good option if you're looking for something comfortable and somewhat luxurious that still tears up the roads, even if the interior is still a little bit from the era where BMW really didn't have everything looking as good as some of their competitors, in my opinion of course. In terms of reliability, the N62 engine has been a hotly debated engine by owners, but on balance I would probably say that the majority know a few key issues with the engine. First and foremost being the fact that it isn't particularly user friendly when it comes to maintaining or modifying it yourself, but also in terms of the price of repairs being incredibly high. Gasket for valve covers, upper timing covers and alternators are all prone to leaking while many other seals are known to leak. In addition to this, the Valvetronic motor has been known to malfunction along with many other potential failures. In general, often these 5 series appear to be quite unfriendly in terms of maintenance and repairs as the M5 is a similar glass cannon when you consider its high performance and high rate of failure. Overall though, I think it's quite a mad car to own. If you're in the UK and you own one of the 11 or you're from anywhere else around the world and have one, do let me know in the comments what it's actually like as a car to own in terms of the ownership fees. Whatever issues the car may have, you can't argue with the stats, and it really does shoot from 0 to 60. Maybe consider getting the far cheaper saloon version instead though, to save the hassle. Narrowly missing out on first is the C5 Audi RS6 Avant, which has a 4.2 litre twin turbocharged V8 that puts out 443 brake horsepower, 560 Nm of torque and goes from 0 to 60 in an unbelievable 4.5 seconds, meaning it is the joint quickest car on this list. This Quattro paved the way for one of the most popular car dynasties in existence, and I am certainly a major fan. One thing that needs to be discussed in relation to this car is the fact that it combines variable valve timing and twin turbocharging, which means means that it has an incredibly wide power band, with maximum torque available from 1950 to 5600 RPM. Utterly insane for an estate. The only 
dead thing about this car in my opinion is the fact that it only comes with that 5 speed Tiptronic automatic box rather than having a manual option, so this will of course mean that you can waft around in slightly more luxury. Another important feature in this car is its use of Audi's dynamic ride control, which constantly adjusts the stiffness of each individual damper to ensure a comfortable ride that also performs incredibly well in terms of grip and poise when cornering, accelerating and braking hard. That said, be aware that some owners have noted the system is going faulty with age and consider swapping it out for coilovers when the cost of replacing or maintaining become too heavy. A plus edition is also available, but this cannot be bought for under £10,000 at the time of making this video. It brought the brake horsepower figure up to 473 and dropped the 0 to 60 down to around 4.3 seconds, and only 999 were produced. You'll know you own one simply by the fact that the last three digits of the car's VIN number is actually on a plaque in the centre console inside the car, which is a pretty cool feature to have. I suppose you could just recreate this in your standard RS6 and still feel like a boss, but it probably wouldn't be quite the same. The best thing about it is that despite these ridiculous specs, it still retains basically what it is to be a practical estate, with the 455 litre boot to transport everything you own around the world being the main factor. That said, it does only do 90 miles per gallon, and that's at a stretch, so slightly less practical for your wallet and in terms of petrol station trips. But either way, I'd probably take this on a driving tour over any other car on this list, just for the pure enjoyment factor. I may come back a much poorer man, but that's not the point. You can pick up a Mark 1 RS6 for as little as 6 grand, but for 10k you're looking at around 80,000 miles and a decent service history, which will be important when buying an RS6 for sure as I've already mentioned the DRC does like to go wrong. In addition to this, the brake pad should be monitored and replaced as necessary considering the car is so quick and yet so heavy, they do like to break down over time. Similarly, the tyre wear is quite extensive on the RS6 so be wary of this. A few people have noted issues with the timing belt, a couple of leaks here and there, but compared with other cars in this list I've listed so far, from what I can see it's mainly maintenance related costs rather than repairs. This is easily the car I'd have off of this list, and definitely a modern classic contender given its responsibility for the RS6 craze we have today. I'd maybe go as far as saying that this car gave a huge boost to the performance estate market, which other manufacturers should probably be grateful for. Taking the top spot on this list we have the rear wheel drive W211 Mercedes-Benz E55 AMG compressor estate, owing to its insane power output. It has a supercharged V8 that puts out 469 brake horsepower, 700 newton meters of torque and also does 0-60 to in 4.5 seconds. This engine actually won the International Performance Engine of the Year award in 2003, owing to its noise, smoothness, performance and drivability. Funnily enough, fuel economy was also included on that list, which the judges must have turned a blind eye to, as you'll be getting 20 miles per gallon on a very good day. The E55 AMG was the fastest four-door Mercedes at the time, and even though it shares its 0-60 time with the RS6, it utterly obliterates the Audi from 0-100 to miles per hour by almost an entire second. In its saloon variant, it was the fastest production saloon available at the time until the S65 AMG was released, and the estate was only released in the later years of production. The E55 was also the best-selling AMG until the C63 was released, which is a pretty insane accolade given the fan base behind AMGs. The W211 platform on which the E55 was built also serves as the base for the CLS class, which was introduced to bring in a slightly younger demographic because, let's face it, the E-class is definitely more directed towards those who have to be a little more responsible, hence the estate option, which has a total of 650 litres of luggage space. The number of E55s on the road in the UK is decreasing pretty rapidly year on year, with more and more being sawned, so you could potentially expect to see these in the hands of collectors rather than families in the not too distant future. There aren't too many estates available for sale at the time of making this video, but there are two in very decent condition for under 10 grand. I would say that the average price you'll be spending on one of these with lower mileage is around 15 grand, going by what's available right now. Again, the saloons are much cheaper and less rare than the estates, so be wary of this. The reliability of the car doesn't really appear to be that bad either. A few people have had issues related to the Valio gearbox radiator, SBC braking system and airmatic suspension, but generally people that bought models from 2005 onwards were very happy with their cars, which is when the estate came in anyway. And if the car does go wrong, the person that put the engine together will have their signature on the engine, so you could always give them a very angry call to discuss the reliability on your Merc. Maintenance can be expensive in terms of keeping the car well looked after, as one would expect from an AMG, so do be wary of this. Overall, this car is a pretty ridiculous sports car that just so happens to have an estate body on it. If it wasn't for my innate and illogical bias towards the Audi RS6, it would be my personal number one, but as always, the stats speak for themselves, hence it cruises its way to the top spot on this list. 
So in this video, I'll talk to you the top five cheap and fast estates that you can buy for less than £10,000. Let me know in the comments down below if you'd put anything else on this list. Remember that I actually mentioned the 335D and the V70R in my previous video, so go check that out if you want to see those two. That's kind of the reason why I didn't include them in this video, just I wanted a bit of variety. Uh, as always, remember to comment and let me know your thoughts on the video and on the cars and all that kind of stuff. But as always, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.